Hello, this is Dr. Gay from First Look MRI, and I'd like to show you how to read an MRI of the brain. So this is a patient who has a normal MRI of the brain, and I just wanted to go over some anatomy and show you what we see and what we look for. So I'm going to start with this view. It's called a sagittal image. If we scoot the patient over, we can see that the nose is off on the left-hand side over here. And we can see the tongue is down over here. The sinuses are right here in the middle. And the forehead is right over here. This area is the frontal bone, which is the forehead. If we roll towards the right-hand side, we can see the right eye. This round area here, you can see the lens in front. And we see the left eye over here. Now, right in the central part of the brain at the midline, we see a little round ball here. This is the pituitary gland. We look carefully at that to make sure the pituitary gland is nice and normal in size. And it sits in a little cup here called the cella. And the cella is normal in size, not expanded. And again, the pituitary tissues look normal. And we can see a pituitary stalk that comes down into the pituitary gland. Now, if we zoom back out here, we can see the cerebrum. The cerebrum is up top here. It starts over here in the front and goes over the top and all the way to the back over here. This is the frontal region. This is the occipital region and back. We have the parietal region over here. If we go off to the edges, we have these areas called the temporal lobes of the brain. And so again, this is all the cerebrum. And the cerebrum has a right side, a right cerebral hemisphere over here. Here's the right eye. And then it has a left side. And the right and left sides are joined by this broad band. It's like a wiring harness right here. It's called the corpus callosum. So we look carefully at the corpus callosum. Sometimes there can be developmental abnormalities in that, or sometimes people with multiple sclerosis will have little lesions that go right up to the edge of that. So we look at that. It looks good in this patient. Now down below, we have something in back here. This is called the cerebellum. The cerebellum looks like cauliflower here on this. And also we have some structures here in the middle. These middle structures are the midbrain and the brain stem. So the midbrain is in this region over here. And then the brain stem is this area to here. This is the pons, which is this ovoid area. And the medulla is more of a straight area. And then if we go down here, we can see the spinal cord that goes down through the neck, comes off the bottom of the brain stem. And this is the cervical spine down here. Now, if we change the orientations, this is that same sequence where we see fluid is really white and the brain parenchyma is more dark and gray. And we're going to go down from the top, down, down, down. Now we see the front is over here. The back is over here. This is the right side, left side. This is what we call an axial image. We're slicing going down, down. We see these longitudinal slits. These are the ventricles, and they're filled with fluid. And we look at the ventricles and see are they normal in size? Are they shifted from right to left? When they're enlarged, we call that hydrocephalus. But the ventricles are nice and normal in size. There's no hydrocephalus. And we come down here. We see the right eye, left eye. Look at the lenses, we see, make sure the eyes are normal in contour, make sure they're not poking out, which we call proptosis. And we see these linear bands coming off the back of the eye. These are the optic nerves. So we look carefully at those to make sure that the optic nerves are normal in appearance, and they are. And we look at all the fat, which is in the orbit here, right and left side. The fat looks preserved and nice. And you may notice these little areas of darkness. These are blood vessels, normal flowing blood. We have two things in the front that are uh, like each other. This is the right and left internal carotid arteries, or the cavernous carotid arteries. And there's another one back here. This is the basilar artery. And we call this the anterior circulation, posterior circulation. If we follow that circulation up, it goes up, up. The internal carotid arteries will end and give rise to this and this. This is the left middle cerebral artery, right middle cerebral artery. And if we keep going up, they give rise to these. These are the anterior cerebral arteries. And so we look there and say, do we have nice flowing blood, which is just jet black? And yes, we do. And both of the internal carotid arteries, the basal artery here looks good. It gives rise to some posterior cerebral arteries. So we really just kind of glance there and make sure that there is normal darkness, which is flowing blood in there. In the very, very back, there's also a dural venous sinus here. So this is a, a venous channel where the blood returns through here. And we look here, is that a nice dark area, or is there abnormal brightness, but it looks like nice, dark, flowing blood within that dural venous sinus. So that looks very, very good. Again, the eyes look good. Now we're going to go down a little bit further, and we look at these two things. This is a, these are called the internal auditory canals. This is the right side, left side. We see these little circles here. These are the semicircular canals. They give balance. And also we have other little things here called the cochlea, this little area here. 
little area over here and just going to glance at these and make sure that there is no tumor within this little canal here, the internal auditory canal, and make sure that these structures look morphologically normal. As we continue down, we go down to the bottom of the cerebellar hemisphere, which is the back cerebellum or the bottom of the cerebellum. And over here we see an area of darkness. This is called the mastoid. So patients can have fluid in these. They can get inflamed called mastoiditis or have other findings. Sometimes tumors can be in here or inflammatory conditions, but these are nice and dark, filled with air. So you see air outside of the patient is dark and air inside here is dark as well. The other thing that can be dark is compact bone. So sometimes you'll see some dark band around the back like this. If you have dense skull bone here, this will be dark. And if you have air in here, it'll be dark. There's also bone in here too, but it, the air and the bone are both just black. So the whole area just looks dark. Same within the sinuses. They are very dark because there's lots of air in the sinuses. This is another orientation where we're looking straight at the patient. If we go very far forward, we'll see the eyes. There's a right eye, left eye. We can see the lenses there in the very front. This is the nose area, sinuses. And with the eye, we can see the optic nerve coming off the back on the right. There's the optic nerve there. And we see this bright stuff around as an orbital fat. And we see these little dark bands. These are the extraocular muscles. These are the muscles that make the eyeballs move. You can see how if this one contracted, it would pull the eye upwards on the left here. So we look at all these structures, make sure these are symmetric in size and make sure the orbital fat is normal. And so everything looks really good with the eyes. If we continue on back here, we eventually get to the internal auditory canals again. Take another look at those. We see them coming across here. The seventh and eighth nerves go through there. And we can see the semicircular canals going up. And also we can see the cochlea on the left-hand side here. And we have thin images. I don't have them on this patient, but we get really super thin images where we can see all the details very nicely and see the individual nerves going through here. And let me go to another sequence now. Now we go to a sequence called an axial image. And this is a sensitive sequence for any abnormalities within the brain parenchyma. So around the periphery, we have what we call gray matter. It's wiggly, serpiginous, bright signal around the edge. And then centrally, we have more dark, uniform signal here. The central stuff is called the white matter. And the peripheral, brighter stuff is called the gray matter. And we look very carefully if patients have migraine headaches, if they have small vessel problems uh, called chronic small vessel ischemia, they have abnormalities there, they can have strokes or bleeds in the brain, and we'll see geographic regions of abnormal brightness or darkness within the brain, and we also can sometimes see the brain pushed to the right or left. And so this is called a flare sequence. Again, it's very, very sensitive for any abnormalities, especially in the white matter. So we look really carefully. Patients with multiple sclerosis will have little white matter lesions. This is just another view that really shows the difference between the gray matter, again, the gray matter on the outside, and then that white matter, which is the dark uniform stuff centrally. And again, we look really, really carefully at all the white matter, make sure there's no evidence of multiple sclerosis. There's no evidence of chronic small vessel ischemia. There's no small tumor within the white matter or within the gray matter. You can go up and down, and we also look at the ventricles again. So in the end, this is a nice normal patient. You can see these blood vessels here, left middle cerebral artery, right middle cerebral artery, and the eyeballs again here. On this sequence as well, the fat is really dark. So you can see fat around the edge is dark, and also fat within the orbits is very dark as well. So if there were an inflammatory condition involved in the eyes, that would stand out. And we can see these optic nerves here again coming off the back. So that is how I read an MRI, and thank you very much.